we can start now a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi karim amma ba'd a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dear brothers and sisters, from today we'll be starting a new topic, which is about the Islamic jurisprudence or Islamic fiqh, its history, its evolution, major jurist and the major madhab. It will be an academic talk, and uh, we'll look at it from legal perspective, and we will also focus on the. Uh, history of the development of different madhab who the major jurists were what were their qualities their contribution the four major jurists as we know are imam abu hanifa imam malik imam shafi and imam ahmad ibn hanbal but there were also some other minor madhab and it's possible that uh, with time we may discuss some of those minor madhab and some of the other scholars as well but for most part we will be focused on the four major sunni madhab the way i have planned it is that the first three lectures will be generic lectures on islamic jurisprudence its history and its evolution and thereafter we will take up the four major jurists and the four madhab inshallah so let's start with what does the fiqh mean the dictionary meaning or the linguistic meaning of the word fiqh is al ilm bi shay which means knowledge of something and in this context the word fiqh and its derivative has been used in the quran as allah subhanahu wa taala mentions qalu ya shuaibu ma nafqahu kathiran mimma taqul allah subhanahu wa taala is quoting us the statement of the people of madian to whom shuaib alayhi salatu was salam was sent as a prophet and when he invited them to tawhid they said o shoaib we don't understand most of what you are telling us so here the word nafqahu which is a derivative of fiqh is used in its linguistic sense of al ilm bi shay now if you go to the deeper meaning the deeper meaning has been given by some scholars as al fiqh haqiqatu shak wal fat that in reality the word fiqh means to split open some to split something and to open something which means the something is hidden and there is something deeper lying inside it so you split it you open it and you reveal what is inside it so the reality of that so wal faqih al alim wal faqih al alim alladhi yashq al akam wa yufattish an haqaiqaha wa yaftahu ma istaghlaqa minha that a faqih or a jurist is a scholar who splits the injunction the legal decisions or legal injunctions and by splitting here they mean that who looks at the evidence from the quran and the sunna and other sources and then he derives the akam wa yufattishu an haqaiqaha he researches about their reality and he opens up what has been covered another meaning of the word fiqh is al ilm bil ahkam ash shar'iyya al far'iyya al muktasab min adalat min adillatiha It's a very comprehensive definition that fiqh is, in Islamic terminology, a science which deals with the peripheral commandments of Islamic Sharia. Now the emphasis here will be al faraiya, <coughs> which means the peripheral issues, which can be derived from its evidences. We'll talk about the evidences of fiqh, inshallah. Now I just want to talk about ahkam al faraiya and al aqam al asliya so al aqam al asliya means the basic injunctions which deal with the aqaid or the belief system of islam and the belief system of islam is not left to human intellect it has been discussed in detail by allah subhanahu wa taala in the quran and by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the aqida is based upon the quran and the sunna and a logical reasoning and personal ijtihad are usually not uh, recommended in this uh, in this field on the other hand al aqam al faraiya or peripheral issues of sharia are where we have the evidence in the quran and in the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
but the interpretation can be different. One mother may take one evidence or interpret the same evidence in a different way and come up with a different ruling. And second mother has his own opinion on it. So there the differences of opinion are simply as a result of different interpretative in different interpretations given by different jurists. Whereas the Akamul Asliya are the collective name for the Aqidah of Al Sunnah Wal Jama, which every Muslim, every Sunni Muslim believes. Another explanation, mostly from the Sufis, are Marifatun Nafs Mala wa Ma Aleha. Actually, this statement is also attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa that it is the knowledge of an individual of what it is for him and what it is upon him, which means the rights and the duties, or you can say, the rights of an individual as well as the obligations which are imposed by the sharia now the word fiqh also comes in the quran and it's a very important very detailed ayah from surah tawbah verse number 122 now you have to remember that surah tawbah is also known as surah al-qital it has to do with the wartime ruling rulings by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but within this comes a very important ayah so I'll spend some time on this verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Badawdu Billah Minish Shaitwanaj or Badawdu Billah Minish Shaitwan Majim. Wama Kanal Mu'minun Wama Kanal Mu'minun Aliyan Feru Kafa. Follow La Nafara min Kulle Fakatim Minum Taif Kulle Tafakahu Fiddin. So Yatafakahu is a derivation of the word fiqh from Tafakko. Wala Yun Zeru Kamahum is a Rajahu Ilehim La Allahum Yadarun. So first, an approximate translation of this verse. That with all this, it is not desirable that all of the believers take the field in time of war. Which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not obligate upon the believers, on all the believers to take part in a battle. From within every group in their midst, some shall refrain from going forth to war and shall devote themselves instead to acquiring a deeper knowledge of the faith and thus be able to teach their homecoming brethren so that these two might guard themselves against evil. So a basic understanding of this verse is that jihad in Islam is a defensive act unless it is preemptive strike. And not every Muslim is obligated to participate in the jihad. It's fard kifaya. If one group does from a community, it fulfills the obligation for the rest of the community. If nobody does the jihad, then the entire community will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the exception is that if there is a pressing need and the state calls upon every capable citizen to join in the war, then nobody can back out. So that's the difference. On the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing the capabilities and physical strengths and intellectual capabilities of different people, wants us to understand that there should also be a party from among the Muslims in every community who shall devote themselves to acquiring a deeper knowledge of the Islamic sciences. And their responsibility is not just to learn, but also to teach the people, including the people who are returning from the war. So it's a very important verse, and I will explain it even further through the Trovan Mufassirin. But I'll just read it that although the above injunction mentions specifically religious knowledge, it has a positive bearing on every kind of knowledge. And this in view of the fact that the Quran does not draw any dividing line between the spiritual and the worldly concerns of life, but rather regards them as different aspects of one and the same reality. Islam is not a system of worship while isolating oneself from this world. It is a complete and comprehensive way of life. In many of its verses, the Quran calls upon the believer to observe all nature and to discern Allah's creative activity in its manifold phenomena and laws, as well, as well as to meditate upon the lessons of history, with a view to getting a deeper insight into man's motivations and the innermost springs of his behavior. So if you look at this phrase, gaining a deeper insight, is actually one way of interpreting the word tafakku. And thus the Quran itself is characterized as addressed to those who think, Ya Ulil Albab. So those ulil abra, ulil albab, ulil absar. In short, intellectual activity as such is postulated 
as a valid way to, be, to a better understanding of Allah's will, and if pursued with moral consciousness, as a valid method of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by this commentary, it emerges that fiqh is not simply related to acquiring religious knowledge or a deeper knowledge of religious sciences, which is, to my mind, the primary objective. But at the same time, another objective, or you can say secondary objective, or a parallel objective is to reflect and gain a deeper knowledge of the nature around us as well. This Quranic principle has been emphasized in many well authenticated sayings of the Prophet. For example, Al Talabul Ilm Farizatun Ala Kulli Muslimin wa Muslimatin. It's a hadith narrated by Ibn Majah. And the English translation is striving after knowledge is a sacred duty, Farida. For every man and woman who has surrendered himself or herself to Allah. The another uh, hadith reported by Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Sunan Darmi is that the superiority of the Fadlul Alim, the superiority of a learned man over a mere worshipper who is Abid, the one who merely prays fast, etc., is like the superiority of the full moon over all the stars. So consequently, the obligation of the believers to devote themselves to acquiring a deeper knowledge of the faith, and to impart its results to their fellow believers, relates to every branch of knowledge, as well as to its practical application. And I think if we keep this in mind, then we can understand that Islam, Islam's periphery, is that Islam's jurisdiction is not just limited to religious sphere, it covers every aspect of human life, every aspect of the issues that we deal with, whether they are religious issues or whether they are non-religious issues. Now, the word fiqh in hadith, an Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may yuridullahu bihi khairan yufaqihu fi al-deen, wa innama ana qasim wallahu yurti. The Prophet وسلم, said that if Allah wants to do good for somebody, Allah intends to do good to somebody, He makes that person comprehend the religion of Islam. Another way will be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon him a deeper understanding of religion in all of its aspects. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the giver, and I, the Prophet وسلم, is mentioning about him, I am Al Qasim, the distributor. So the knowledge came through Wahi to the Prophet. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave that wisdom, that knowledge to his Sahaba and it has been passed on to subsequent generations. Now, another definition of the word al-fiqh in the Ahlul Haqiqah. And the word Ahlul Haqiqah will be the people of reality. It may be referring to mystics, Allah knows best. And it is al-jam'u bain al-ilm wal-amal that it's a combination of knowledge and acting upon that knowledge. Now we know the beautiful sayings of the Prophet وسلم, where he requested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him knowledge that will benefit. So if you have if we have knowledge but we do not act according to that knowledge, then we may fall into the category of Ya Al Kitab Why do you say things that you do not do yourself? Hassan al Basri has mentioned in Namal Faqi ul Murid Anid Dunya that a real, really knowledgeable person is someone who turns away from the dunya, whose focus is not dunya, who is focused in the matters of the akhirah, and who looks at his own faults rather than looking at somebody else's fault. <clears throat> Actually, I had a discussion with some of my friends when I quoted uh, this thing, and they say, you know, what do you mean by this thing that the faqih should be totally cut away from dunya? This is not what this narration means. Hassan al basri is talking about people who make religion their profession, who will sell the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a paltry sum. He's talking about that the real faqi will be whose objective from learning the religion of Islam is not for the sake of this dunya. His reward, he's seeking his reward in the akhirah. He does not gain knowledge in order to criticize others. Oh, you are not praying right, or you are doing this thing wrong. But he wants to correct himself, self-reformation. He looks at his own faults. So I, I really wanted this definition to get across along with the interpretation that I have given. 
Now, when did the Islamic jurisprudence or Islamic fiqh actually begin? Now, if we look at it, the verse of the Quran, in the dina in the la islam, that the way of life or the deen, religion, that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Islam, which can also mean submission, which means we live our life according to the wish and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this, we have to understand what is Allah's intention, what is Allah's will, how does Allah want us to live our life, what are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do, and what are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to avoid. So if I look at this way in the dina in the Islam, that the and Islam has been the deen forever. So the fiqh has actually been there forever. And you can say that the first sharia was actually given to Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. And you will look at it. So my understanding of inna dina in the lail Islam is there's talking about ways of Islam, the rights and duties, individual and societal boundaries, mutual rights and responsibilities. They also fall within the purview of the Islamic fiqh. Now, as I mentioned that the first Sharia was given to Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. That's my understanding based upon this verse of Surah, uh, surah Al-Baqarah. قُلْ نَحْبِتُ مِنْهَا جَمِيًا فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَىٰ يَفَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَهُمْ يَعْزَنُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Adam alayhi salatu wa salam and Hawa alayhi salam and Shaitan as well to get down, to come down. And then he said that whenever guidance from me comes to you, now this guidance, the scholars have explained it can be in the form of revelation, in the form of a mushaf, sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or in the form of the intellect, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to human beings. So whoever follows my guidance, they will have nothing to fear and nothing to grieve. So who was the first recipient of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The first couple, Adam alayhi salatu wa salam and Hawa, they were told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how to live their life. And that is the meaning of the sharia. Sharia doesn't mean imposing our aqidah and our thought on somebody. Sharia we should be applying to ourselves. It's the way of life that we want to adopt in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. So that's why I put down how to live in accordance with Allah's commands and how to worship Him. Now, another verse is from Ibrahim wasalam, that after he had, uh, he and uh, Ibrahim alayhi salat, uh, Ismail had established the Kaaba, they had rebuilt, they requested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa arena manasik. Oh Allah, show us the manasik. And I think the vast majority of the scholars, if not all the scholars, mention that here the manasik is referring to the rituals of Hajj because Baitullah is connected with Hajj. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam and Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam had rebuilt the Kaaba, but they wanted to know how they can perform the Hajj. So that knowledge of how to perform the Hajj is also fit and understanding. But they did not want to come up with the practice or the different rituals or different manasik of Hajj. I don't want to use the word ritual. I would use the word manasik. They didn't want to come up on their own. They wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show it to them. Now, there is a narration most likely from Hassan Basri and Wallahu Alam who mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam to show Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam and Islam, Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam how to perform Hajj. So if you look at Kitabul Hajj, which is one of the chapters of Islamic fiqh, we can say that it started, that part started with Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. So fiqh is not, Islamic fiqh is not something that is started with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. It reached its peak, al akmaltu lakum dinakum. But the process had started way back and it has gone through evolution. There is Sharia, there is fiqh given to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. There was fiqh and Sharia given to uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam did not establish a new Sharia. But the Sharia of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam had been altered and he came to rectify it. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never left human beings without guidance, both related to the acts of worship and to worldly affairs. So I would look at it as guidance towards solving problems through the prophets and the divine books. That mankind, since the time we came on this planet earth, we needed guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept sending guidance to solve our day-to-day -day problems, both in the sphere of religion and the sphere of our daily life, through his prophets and through his divine books, which is the as well as the intellect. So if you are 
in a situation where you do not have access to Quran or the Hadith, which will be uh, unusual, or more likely that you have an issue, you look through the Quran, you don't find it. You look through the Hadith, you don't find it. And obviously, you have to ask the scholars, you are not at their level. But the Mujtahideen, they were given the intellect by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use their own ijtihad. And we will look at it in the context of the Hadith of uh, Muaz ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an. So now I'm talking about the evolution of Islamic jurisprudence from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I gave you a historical perspective, but now we will be focusing, focusing more on the Islamic jurisprudence from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam onwards. So the scholars have looked at six time periods over which the Islamic jurisprudence evolved. The first obviously is the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He received the revelation over 23 years. And the question will be, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not reveal the Quran? And why did he not give this entire legislation all at once? We will look at it in the light of the Quran. The second phase of the development of Islamic fit is the period of this Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ashmain. Then come the followers of the Sahaba, which are the Tabi'un. Then the early jurist, Al-Mujtahidun. And these Mujtahidun are, the spelling is not correct, and the Mujtahidun is not the ha. It's a ha. The earliest mujtahidun will be obviously the four fuqaha, but then there were people who were ahead of them as well. So we'll talk about some of them, uh, inshallah, with time. Then come the period of the followers of the earlier jurist. I apologize for this spelling mistake. It's not or it is of the period of the followers of the earliest jurist and then the contemporary jurisprudence. So we'll look at it all in detail, inshallah, uh, over the next few lectures. Now, why was it? necessary for the Sharia to evolve over a period of time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this issue. So a challenge to the Prophet was thrown by the people or challenge was given to him that why if the Quran is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not reveal the Quran all at once? They were implying, this is what our Mufassirun mentioned, they were implying that the Prophet wasallam was writing the Quran Ma'azallah on his own whenever a situation demanded. Instead of acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing it through his wisdom piece by piece according to the necessities and dictates of the time. So the translation of the meaning, those who reject faith Say, why is not the Quran revealed to him, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all at once? Thus, it is thus is it revealed that we may strengthen thy heart thereby. So, the sabbita bihi fuadak. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given a very heavy responsibility by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's not easy for anybody to bear that responsibility to be the last Prophet of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and to re receive the Quran. If we had revealed this Quran on top of a mountain, it would crumble under the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Quran was being revealed to the heart by, the, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel salatu wasalam, and it required gradual revelation to strengthen the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then waratallahu tartila. Now, Rattallahu Tartila here doesn't mean the Ilmut Tajweed of the Quran. It's explained differently by the scholars, and I will give you three different translations. So, first translation of Rattallahu Tartila is, and we have rehearsed it to thee, Prophet Sallallahu in slow, well arranged stages gradually. And I like this phrase, slow, well arranged stages gradually. The Quran is very well arranged, both chronologically and the way it is arranged in the form of a musab to us. And it is Allah's hikmah that he did it this way. Another way of looking at Barat Allah Tartila is, for we have so arranged its component parts that they form, it's not from it, they form one consistent whole. And this is something very important from the point of view of the Quranic studies and the challenges that we Muslims receive that the Quran does not appear to be coherent. It is random and it is not random. It is one consistent whole but it requires intellect, it requires a lifetime of a study to connect one verse with the previous verse and the next verse to connect one section 
with the previous section and the next section to connect one surah with the previous surah and the next surah and then interpret verses and surah in the context of the entire Quran, which is one whole, complete whole. Another way of Varat Allahu is, and we have revealed it at a deliberate pace. So different scholars have looked at it in a different way, but they all mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom chose to reveal the Quran gradually with the primary objective of strengthening the heart of the Prophet sallallahu and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already planned how it will come in different stages. We'll look at it in more, excuse me, in more detail. So now, education is a gradual process. When a child goes to the school, you cannot expect that he will learn everything on his first day in school. My education is not finished. And I'm sure that all of you educated people who are listening will acknowledge that you cannot say that your education is done. There's no more to learn. It's a gradual process. It takes time to think as well. Changing and strengthening of the heart of every thinking believer is not an easy task. When the Prophet was dealing with people of all kinds, there were people who were simple Badawis. They did not have much intellect. And I'm not saying that most all of them did not have it. Then there were people who were highly intellectual, like Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, Ali radiallahu ta'ala no, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala no, Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala no. There were also people who were quite adamant, obstinate. Some of them eventually acknowledged the truth of Islam and became Muslims. And others like Abu Jail and Abu Lahab didn't accept it till the day they died. Changing the mindset, abolishing the unfounded and irrational customs of Jahiliya and replacing them with what is appropriate and in accordance with Allah's will is another objective and uh, another wisdom behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in different stages. He had already planned it. The Quran was there with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we Muslims believe. The majority of orthodoxy believes that. But he chose to reveal it gradually to train people and to prepare them for the, the final message that was coming. Now, slow, well-arranged stages. Though the stages were gradual as the occasion demanded from time to time, in the course of 23 years, the whole emerged, with the whole Quran, the whole message of the Quran emerged when completed as a well-arranged scheme of spiritual instruction, as we have seen in following the arrangement of the surahs. So inshallah, not, uh, I have this in mind to talk about the Nazmul Quran, which means the concordance and the beauty of the arrangement of the Quran, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it in a different a uh, different way. And then the Quran, when it was compiled in the form of a Musaf, it's different than the, uh, the order of the surahs which were revealed. Both have their own wisdom. And we, we, inshallah, we'll look at it at some point. Now, I will give you some examples of the evolution of Islamic fiqh from the Quran. First is the prohibition of alcohol drinking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not prohibit alcohol right away. He first mentioned that it has some benefits, but the harms are more than that. And those who are Ahlul, uh, Ahlul Lub, Ahlul Basira, they immediately recognized what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted. So they quit drinking alcohol even at that stage. The second stage was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wala taqrabu salata wa sukara. That if you are in a state of drunkenness, do not approach the prayers because then you don't know what you are saying. Then the third was, Fajtanibu, complete avoidance. And we have a hadith, I believe, and I may be wrong, may Allah correct me, that Anas radiallahu ta'ala no, no mentioned that when the final verse about the prohibition of alcohol drinking was revealed in Medina, the streets of Medina were flooded, were, uh, were flooding with the alcohol because people were storing alcohol in different pots in their homes. And when the verse was revealed, Fajtanibu, they brought all of those pots and they broke them on the streets and just alcohol was flowing everywhere. They were not drinking. Similarly, prohibition of usury. The final commandment came almost at the end of the process of revelation. Similarly, fasting was also obligated in different stages. Inshallah, I'll be giving some Ramadan reminders during the month of Ramadan, and I will talk about that issue in detail at the time, inshallah. Now, during the lifetime of the Prophet, how were things going on? 
So the Quran was being revealed in response to the demands of the circumstances and current issues. People were coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi They were asking questions. We'll talk about that. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became the head of the Islamic State in Medina. And he was given the authority to, to legislate and to use his ijtihad as well. I will mention two adhis without going into the details. O people who believe, obey Allah and obey the Rasul. So it means that itatullah and itatul Rasul are both compulsory. In fact, one scholar that I read mentioned that there is no verse in the Quran where itatullah is mentioned without mentioning the itat of Rasul. In fact, it is Waman Ata Rasul Fakat Ata Allah who has obeyed the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has indeed obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who has disobeyed the Prophet sallallahu has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Mama Atakum Rasulu Fakuduhu Wama Nahakum Anhufantahu. That whatever the Prophet sallallahu gives you, you take it. And what he forbids you, you stay away from it. In fact, there is a hadith about it that a woman came to the Prophet uh, to Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala no, after the Prophet sallallahu had passed and he talked about some cosmetic things and he said, is it prohibited in the Quran? And Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala said, yes, it is prohibited in the Quran. And she says, no, I have read the Quran. It is not mentioned in And Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala has quoted this verse, rasulu wama that if you had read the Quran, you would have read this verse, that whatever the Prophet sallallahu gives you, you take it and what he forbids you, you stay away from it. Which means the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is an independent source of Sharia as well. Now, Yes, alunaka. You must be familiar with this verse. Yes, alunaka anil ahila. Yes, alunaka anil bahid. There are different verses. Yes, alunaka anil qital. This this construction they ask you, O Prophet Sallam, comes in the Quran thirteen times. There are twelve verses, and I think one verse is two. Yes, alunaka. Mm -hmm. So people would ask, would come and ask the Prophet Sallam these questions mentioned in the Quran. Although there are other questions which are not mentioned in the Quran, people would come and ask him different questions. But these 13 are very important questions where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself gave the answers. In the other situation, the Prophet ﷺ gave the answer himself. Were those answers based upon his understanding of the Quran? Were those answers given to him through revelation? Or did he use his ijtihad is a different matter. So people would come and ask questions from the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal the answers. This is pertaining to these 13 questions, yes, alunaka. But there are also several questions, as I mentioned earlier, reported in the prophetic traditions. Now, the Prophet sallallahu did he use ijtihad? Or did he always follow the direct revelation? Now, I don't mean to say that if he followed ijtihad, he did not follow the revelation. I'm not saying this thing. I'm talking about the situations where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not revealed any words as yet. And the Prophet was asked the question. So did he use his ijtihad or did he say, no, I, I cannot answer at all. There are situations where he would say, no, I will wait for the way. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that the Prophet should So this was a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet that when you judge between people, you judge according to what has been revealed to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means the Quran. So if you look at this verse, it means that the Prophet was obligated, he was commanded to judge only according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in matters where there was dispute among people. And the Prophet used to uh, decide according to the Quran. But if he did not have a text with him, then the Prophet will use this ijtihad. And we get an evidence from a hadith in which the Prophet mentioned that in Nakum Takta Semuna Ilaya, Falla Badukum Ayakuna Al Hana Behujatim Bad, Faman Adetu Lahu Behakin Behaki Ahi, if in Nama Akta Lahu, Kat Atum Minanar, Fal Yahmilha or Layazarha. That the Prophet said that you bring your disputes to me. And one of you may be more eloquent in pleading with this case. And I may decide in his favor. That is this decision according to the Prophet. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the answer, it will be truth. But the Prophet as a human being, he used his ijtihad based upon his best understanding. But if the other person who was lying, 
and he was usurping the right of his brother, then he is cutting a piece for himself in the hellfire, which means he is uh, booking a piece of land, Mazala, Summa Mazala, in the hellfire. So the Prophet says that either he should take it or he should leave it, which means he's saying that if you are wrong, but you have convinced me through your eloquence that you are right, then I'm telling you that if you are wrong, you are buying yourself a place in hellfire. So either you carry that burden upon yourself or you give up because it is not your right. So this is an indication, an evidence that the Prophet wasallam in certain issues gave his own, uh, gave the answer according to his ijtihad. And there are issues where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed a different verse, which was not consistent with the ijtihad of the Prophet wasallam. For example, when prisoners were taken at the time of Battle of Badr, the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr Siddiq no, wanted to release them. And Umar no, gave a different uh, opinion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually supported the opinion of Umar. No. There is also another incident from Surah Tahrim. That the Prophet is a long story. The Prophet said that he will not uh, eat honey. This is one of the narrations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that, you know, why are you making it haram upon you when Allah has made it halal? Do you want to do so just to please your wives? Now, this is a very important uh, ayah. And Sheikh Mawduddi Maulana Abu Lala Mawduddi has given a very beautiful explanation of that. That the Prophet sallam, was the last prophet of Allah. If he made something undesirable or haram for himself, no Nabi will come after him. No uh, revelation will come after him and that thing will become haram forever whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made haram for him and the uh, and evidence is from uh, that all foods were made halal for Bani Israel except all what Israel Yaqub had made forbidden upon himself only because of some health issues but because prophets were to come after uh, Yaqub this would not be a big issue. But if the Prophet Sallallahu said that I'm not eating honey, it is forbidden for me, then that will be a problem because there is no Nabi to come after him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and there is no Quran to come after him. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala intervened here. Now, Shaykh Madhudi also derives that in other issues where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gave an answer according to his ijtihad, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala did not reveal any words to change it, it means that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala confirmed the ijtahad of the Prophet So if we don't find something in the Quran, but if we find it in the hadith, authentic hadith, then we have to accept it, that it is it has the stamp of approval by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet judged and ruled according to the revelation, but he also used his reasoning in cases about which there was no revelation. So now, the Prophet also taught people to use their mind, to use their intellect. And here I have uh, evidence from a hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas that Qala ja ila Nabi sallallahu Abbas mentioned that a person came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said that, O oh, your last messenger, وسلم, my mother had passed away. And she could, she had to observe the fast of the Ramadan. Maybe she left some fast. I, I don't know the details. So shall I fast on her behalf? Shall I make the compensation in this way? And instead of giving an answer, yes or no, the Prophet وسلم, said, what do you think that if your mother had borrowed money from somebody, would you pay on her behalf? Now he's asking that person to use his own reasoning. This is, I think, a very important concept that the Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing that in certain issues, you can use your ishtihad if there is nothing in the Quran or the Sunnah, and if you are at that level, to do ishtihad. So he said, yes, of course, if my mother had borrowed money from somebody, if she was in debt to somebody, I will pay off, pay off her debt. So then the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah's debt is more deserving to be paid. So now I say, go and fast on her behalf. Now we have a very famous hadith of Muad ibn Jabal, although I must mention 
that this hadith is graded as naif by uh, Imam Nasiruddin al-Albani and other scholars. But many scholars have accepted this hadith and it becomes the basis for ishtihad. And the reason is that the meaning of this hadith is supported by other ahadith. So the hadith comes from uh, Ashab of Muaz ibn Jabal. So the companions of Muaz ibn Jabal would narrate this thing. So again, there is some problem with the chain of transmission. Then when the Prophet wasallam sent Muaz ibn Jabal anhu, to Yemen, he said, So Muaz ibn Jabal is being sent as a representative of the Prophet wasallam, and Muaz was a highly intelligent person. He was very well versed in Islamic fiqh. So the Prophet said that if the case is brought to you, how would you decide? And he said, that's a very important thing. Don't put your opinion before Allah and His Prophet. So he said, I will judge according to the book of Allah. Qala, I call Rasulullah sallallahu The Prophet said, Fa'illam tajid fi kitab, fi kitab Allah, qala bi sunnati Rasulullah sallallahu If you do not find it in the book of Allah, what would you do? So Ma'ad ibn uh, Jabal radiallahu ta'ala said, then I will decide according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Now it means that Muaz knew the Quran and Muaz was also familiar with a large proportion of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu He had spent years with the Prophet sallallahu Then the Prophet asked this very important question. What if you don't find it in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and you don't find it in the book of Allah? Then he says, Kala that I will use my intellect or I will act according to my understanding and I will not leave any stone unturned, which means it's not a matter of simple opinion. It will be a process. The word ijtihad is from Bab ifti'al, which means striving, taking time to formulate an opinion, not just a reflex knee-jerk reaction. The Prophet put his hand on his uh, chest. Now the word daraba doesn't mean he struck. He put his hand. It could be gentle touch as well. And he said, Alhamdulillah, Rasul Rasulullah Rasulullah That he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they get the tawfiq, the guidance to the messenger of the messenger of Allah sallallahu which pleased the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's very important hadith to remember. I've already given you the translation. So now, we find something similar, as I mentioned, that although the hadith of Maaz ibn Jabal is considered to be zaif only because of the sanad, not because of the text, the text is supported by other hadith as well as the letter written by Umar ta'ala not to Abu Musa al-Ashari. So when he sent him, he sent a letter to him. And this is one part of the letter, the whole letter you can find on the internet. So he says, Suma al-fam al-fam, fima adla ilayka mimma laysa fi Qur'ani wa la sunna. So he said, use your understanding. Do use your understanding. Which means ishtihad. When you are unsure about a matter not found in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the next part is very important, which is about the analogical reasoning and the precedence. He said, acquire a good knowledge of like and similar cases and judge matters by analogy with others. Now this part is actually built into the legal system of any country. It's the law of precedent that a case is brought before the judges and it is not to be found in the constitution. But there is a similar case in history and they will use analogical reasoning and give the decision that was given in the earlier case as well. So this is used in legal system and it is Umar to, it is to Umar uh, credit that he used this word al-amsal wal ashba. So like cases, similar cases, which means precedence or analogical reasoning. Now after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what happens? So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala completed the Sharia in this sense, Al Yom Akmaltu Lakum Dina Kum wa Atmam to Alekum Namati wa Raditu Lakum al Islam Adina. That today I have perfected, I'm not using the word complete, I'm using the word perfected, it's in even higher degree. I have perfected for you your religion and I have completed upon you my nama, which majority of scholars mentioned means prophethood, and I am pleased for you to accept Islam as your way of life. Now, what does that mean? It means no more prophets, no more divine revelation, 
no more divine book. The belief system has been completed. Principles have been let down to solve newer problems by way of analogy. And I wanted to emphasize that part. Quran is a book of guidance. Quran gives a lot of principles. The actual number of uh, legal verses in the Quran is estimated to be about 500. But th there are important principles. And then we have the Adis, which the Adis of Akam may number about 2,500 or thereabouts. Allah knows best. But the principles are given by both Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the Adis of the Prophet sallam, through which newer problems can be solved by way of analogical reasoning. The Sharia is not shut and closed in that sense, but the Sharia is that it has reached its uh, height, it has reached its perfection in this sense. Now, in the last sermon of the Prophet, sallam, he mentioned, and this hadith has been narrated by uh, Malik bin Anas. And it reach it's, it's a mursal hadith. So there is no sahabi in between. So Qala Rasulullah, this is the version in Mawatta. There are other versions as well. The Prophet said, Tarak to fikum amren. I am leaving behind two things with you. Lan ma bihama. You will not be misguided as long as you hold on to them. Kitabullah wa sunnata Rasulai. Allah's book and the Sunnah of his Prophet. In another hadith, the Prophet mentioned that Khairun Nasa Karni Thumma Lazina Yulunam, Thumma Lazina Yulunam, Thumma Yajiu Akwam Tasbeku Shahada to Adim Yaminahu, wa Yaminu Shahada Tahu. It's an important hadith narrated by Abdullah bin Masud Radiallahu Ta'ala Nof and it said reported in Sahih Bukhari, it's an authentic hadith that the Prophet said the best people are those of my generation, which means the Sahaba. Then those who come after them, At Tabi'un. Then those who come after them, At Baut Tabi'in. Then there will come people after them whose testimony precedes their oaths and their oaths precede their testimony. A beautiful way of saying that you really cannot trust those people, not all of them. Now, what does that mean is one interpretation of this hadith is the best understanding of the religion of Islam is the understanding of the first three generations. I mean, you can imagine, you can ask yourself a question that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Sahaba of that time to be the first recipient of Allah's revelation? Because their iman was stronger than the iman of any other generation after them. And they understood the religion because they had the Prophet of Allah وسلم, as their teacher. Who could be the best, better teacher than him? Who was the first recipient of the Quran himself. So that's why we have to understand this thing. So I will stop here and inshallah we'll continue this series uh, for two more sessions inshallah before the Ramadan, before we take a break. And then after Ramadan we will be talking about the four major jurists and the four major Sunni Madaid. And inshallah, as we go along, we may discuss some of the other scholars, other contributors to Islamic sciences. Akoli kali haza wa astaghfirullah wa lakum wa la zikrullahi akbar. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.